Okay. Defaults, workouts, and foreclosures. Okay, this is kind of the wrong end of the business to be on. Not, you don't want to see this happening. But unfortunately, when we have bad things happen, it creates opportunities. So these opportunities is where realtors thrive. Um, this is where a lot of your business comes from. And this is not by cho this is not the proactive choice that people want to happen. It's just a nature of the marketplace. Um, I yeah. Love it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, oh yeah, I did. Mean, okay, yeah, chapter eleven. <laughs> yeah, no fun, no fun. Um, and there are forms of bankruptcy. What? Seven, eleven, and thirteen. <laughs> okay, so again, it's not where people want to be, but it's it's part of the marketplace. So you need to understand what happens in the marketplace, why these things happen, and what what opportunities are going to be created from them, and. People are going to call you, specifically sellers will call you and say, I'm in trouble. You need to help me get out of trouble as a realtor. What can you do to help me get out of it? Um, so you need to understand a little bit about this. You're not attorneys, and you're going to tell them to seek the advice of an attorney. But you're going to say, after you've been around for a while, you're going to say, I've been through this before. You really don't have anything to worry about. Let me hold your hand a little bit, and I'll walk you through the process. We'll get you there. This is not a life and death thing. You're losing property, but you're not dying. So we'll get through this and we'll make it. So we're going to talk about what events cause defaults. We're going to understand the lender's options. We're going to learn what occurs on loan workout. We're going to talk about common forms of loan workouts and methods of foreclosure and then the rights of junior leaners following foreclosure. So a default occurs when the borrower fails to observe those duties and promises. What What is the primary thing that they default on? What is it they don't do? Pay their mortgage. Pay their mortgage. You, pay, you don't pay your mortgage because you lose a job, because you have medical issues, because you're going through a divorce, or somebody in your family dies. Those are things that happen to most people in their lifetime. You're going to be there somewhere. Um, most of us are going to get hit somewhere along the line. We're going to experience it for ourselves. And you cannot continue to pay a mortgage if you don't have a job or if things are happening with your family. Most mortgages and deeds of trust contain what we call an acceleration clause requiring the borrower to pay all payments due under the promissory note if the default occurs. So they, again, you're not, you take that $130,000 loan out, it's $400,000 after 30 years, but if you default in year three or four, you're not going to owe $400,000, but you're still going to, it's going to be somewhere near $130,000. Because in an amortizing loan, your first few years, you're not hardly paying anything on principal. So you haven't bought down that loan a whole lot. So you're going to say, wait a minute, I still owe almost what I paid for. Yes. You need to understand what amortizing loan does. You're not going to pay a lot in, on your equity in the first couple of years. So if the borrower or mortgager defaults, the lender, mortgagee, can pursue a variety of options based upon terms of the mortgage and the state law. Guess what? You signed a mortgage document. It said you're going to pay, make all the payments. You're going to have insurance. You're going to do certain things. And when you default, if you still remember where your mortgage is, you can pull it out and figure out what's going to happen. Because it's all there in writing what they can do. Creditor rights. So the lender can pursue following remedies. They can set up collections. They can go through something called judicial foreclosure. They can go through something non-judicial foreclosure, or the lender can take over the operations of the property through receivership. Receivership is something we see in commercial properties. As a property manager, this is something I've had to do before. It's not a pretty place to be. You have to take over the property and operate it, and you don't have money to operate with. But you have to do certain things to keep the property safe and keep it running. And you've got to go to the court to ask permission to get money and have the bank give you money to keep things going. And the idea behind a receivership is you're trying to keep the property running so that you can keep tenants in place, maybe find some new tenants, and then after a year or so, you can sell the property. You try to bring it back up and turn it around and try to sell the property. Unfortunately, with a lot of property management companies, brokers love receiverships because they get named as the listing broker through this whole process. Property managers, we don't like it so much. we got to work our butts off, and we don't get a reward. We just keep a job but we don't get the bonus or anything like that for getting sold. But 
It's part of our business in property management is receivership. And generally that's commercial properties. Um, the collection methods and everything, the other thing you need to remember, mortgage companies don't want to take your property back. They really don't. It's a pain in the butt to deal with. They probably have a supply already of properties that they don't know what to do with. They will generally try to call you and they will work out something with you, a extended payment plan or something to do collections. And as long as you're honest with them, as long as you're paying on the plan that you've agreed to, they won't come after you. They'll let it, let it go, let you do exactly what you promised them you're going to do. They really don't want to take the, the house back from you. Workout is a non-foreclosure response to the default. The borrower and lender attempt to compromise their respective positions and rights so that neither party receives the entire benefit of the original bargain. In other words, I'm not going to pay the full mortgage and I'm not going to get everything that, that I was going to get under the thing. So both sides lose a little bit in a workout, but it keeps everybody in place. It lets things function. And again, the banks are much more likely to do a workout than they are to do a foreclosure as long as you're honest and you do what you say you're going to do. So again, people come call on you and say, ah, everything's going bad. You know, sit down and talk to them. Sometimes you're not going to get the listing, but you're going to talk to them about what happens. And, and let me help you keep your house. Then when you get back on your feet and things change in the next five years, stay their friend for a while. Then when they're ready to sell and move on, you'll be their agent. So you got to make some friends with people and help them out. A workout investigation will also determine whether the borrower has any legal remedies, such as fraud, negligence or duress, breach of a contract, or bad faith. They're going to try to investigate what are you doing. They're going to ask you a lot of questions. And again, this is part of that workout process. Are you hiding money? Are you hiding things? You know, you lose your job. What kind of savings do you have? By the way, People don't have to go borrow their 401 to keep their house. You know, you don't have to borrow your 401 to, to stop from filing bankruptcy. You know, you've got retirement money. You want to keep that out there. That's for you when you get old. You can file bankruptcy. You can lose your house, but don't touch your 401. Again, that's a way to hold people's hand and keep them there. Types of pre-foreclosure workout plans. They can modify the terms of the loan. They can do a loan rein reinstatement. They can do a voluntary conveyance to the lender, which is a deed in lieu of foreclosure. And deed in lieu is basically when they give the keys to the mortgage company. It can be a commercial or residential property. Here you go. Here's my keys. I'm walking out. I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the deed. I'm going to give you the property, and I'm going to leave. I'm done. The bank gets it back. The bank can sell it for whatever the bank can sell it for. Um, Sale to a third party can be what's called a short sale. A short sale is different than a deed in lieu foreclosure. Short sale is, is you agree to sell it short. It's not worth its market value. They may not get the full mortgage value. But they agree to work with you to sell it short to make it happen. Short sales can take a year, up to a year to happen. Um, there's realtors I know of that don't like to work on short sales because of how the process happens. They're not comfortable with dealing with it. But again, the idea behind a short sale or a deed in lieu is it shouldn't impact your credit. You agree to do this because they're not going to do detrimental things to your credit. The other thing, though, about a short sale or deed in lieu, when the bank sells it for less than the bank is owed, there's still an amount of money that's, that's out there that the bank can come back after you. It's, it's the shortfall. And they can still come back after you. They can write it off. And typically in a short sale, they will write it off, but they don't really write it off totally. They give you a 1099 at the end of the year and say they just gave you twelve or twenty or thirty thousand dollars. So now all of a sudden you have to pay taxes on it. So a lot of people don't remember that about a short sale, that you could have to pay taxes on the short piece. So it's not all what it's cracked up to be. Norman's back there going, huh? Because it, it happens and people get just bowled over by it. So foreclosure is the legal process of terminating the borrower's claims of ownership. We have what's called a judicial foreclosure. And in Ohio, we prescribe by the judicial foreclosure process. There's a file and serve complaint. You, if you're an owner of the house, you'll be served papers. You have to come to a hearing at the county 
where the judge is going to sit down and talk with you in this hearing room and go through the process and talk to you about the foreclosure and what's going to happen foreclosure. And the bank is going to have their suits, their attorneys there to make their claim to say why they want to go ahead and have this foreclosure. There's a trial and order of the foreclosure sale. And then there's something called equity redemption rights. Equity redemption rights gives the person who's being foreclosed on, foreclosed on the chance to redeem themselves. And how do they redeem themselves? They typically find money from family. It's hard to get it from another bank when you're already in foreclosure. Somebody's probably not going to loan it to you. But you find money from somewhere and you can literally pay off the mortgage. But we have that equity redemption. It's in this whole judicial process that you have so many days to try to come up with money to buy yourself out of your foreclosure. And they have to let it happen. Yeah. Is there like a minimum or? Yeah. And, and that's based on each contract and what's going on with the bank. It's not, it doesn't have to be 100%. It's, it's not always 100%. It's 70 80%. But you'll, you'll come to terms with them for what equity redemption is. But yeah, everybody's in problems. And sometimes it's better for the bank to work with you to lose 20% than for them to lose even more. So that's part of this whole negotiation process of foreclosure, too. It doesn't have, you know, you can still keep negotiating. Even though you're in trouble, you can still keep negotiating to not come up with 100% of what's out. It's a percentage. And again, the banks will work with you more than you realize because they don't want to go through the process of having to resell it, have to take care of the house, have to boot you out. It's a whole lot easier to work with you on terms to keep you there. A foreclosure sale and statutory redemption rights. Some states give the borrower an additional right to redeem property called a statutory redemption period once the court has confirmed the sale. Okay, the court already, you went to court and they confirmed the sale is going to happen. But the sale doesn't happen instantly. It's not there. It takes a few weeks before they can schedule it, before they have the foreclosure sale and stuff like that. I was playing around on websites last night and I found out that in Ohio we have judicial foreclosure but we have ju deficiency judgment are yes they are allowed so you can go back and like I said you can negotiate that smaller amount redemption allowed after the sale yes up until the court confirms the sale so Somebody comes to a foreclosure sale. They're buying it off the, the steps of the foreclosure. Sale sold done. You offer your money. Until the court can confirm that sale, that person still has a few minutes where they can come in and buy it out. It's not all the way done yet. And in some states, there's even days after the sale happens, this redemption period. So investors on those states where they've got a longer redemption period, investors come in, they take the house, they won't work on it for a while. They let it just sit because they don't want to be putting time and effort into it only to lose it through this redemption process. Now, it's not drawn out, but it can be a couple weeks. It can be a while depending upon what state, yes. Most of them are not that long. Most of it's just it's a window, shorter window. But no, again, you're helping your clients. They, they feel like the world's dropping in on them. They, if they can still have more time than they realize to come up with this equity redemption piece. Reinstatement is available under the state law. In Ohio, there's no reinstatement available. In Kentucky, it's a little different. And it's just over the river, but they, it's similar, but it is a little different. In Kentucky, it's again judicial foreclosure. Yes, the borrower is personally served or makes an appearance in the court. Um, is redemption allowed? Not always. It's called sometimes. So Kentucky doesn't force redemption. And is the re reinstatement available? Generally, no. There's no right to reinstate except as permitted on the terms of the mortgage. If a loan is a high-cost home under Kentucky statutes, foreclosing party must provide a notice or default give part at least 30 days to reinstate before the filing foreclosure complaint. Again, what's a high-cost home? You have to look up the state statute to see what that is. In Ohio, it's all the same, no matter whether it's a a $1,500 home or a $500,000 home, it's still the same. Kentucky, they're going to give some price difference. So there are some things going on here. And you have, again, the right of redemption, stopping a foreclosure, getting a home back afterward. It's interesting stuff to know. And again, you want to advise people that are coming to you that feel stressed and strained. It's not the end of the world. You can make it happen. 
judicial foreclosure. They set aside foreclosures. Um, there's something called shock the conscious standard, um, where I read about this. And I thought, what? What is that? Shock the conscious standard, which infers some fraud that should cause the sale to be set aside. Okay. And a gross inadequacy standard. Gross inadequacy. The home's offered at a foreclosure sale. They can't get somebody to pay anywhere near the market price. Somebody comes in and they're able to buy a, a $300,000 home for $20,000. There's a gross inadequacy about that. And the person who's at that foreclosure sale is thinking they're getting a hell of a deal. What's going to happen is the bank and everybody involved is going to come back and say, stop, sorry, it's grossly inadequate. This is not what this procedure is for to allow this to happen. They want to try to take away that whole thing. Person offered twenty thousand, give them the twenty thousand dollar back, make them whole. But let's go back on the market. Let's get some time to get offers on the house. Let's do what we have to do to get offers on it. That's what gross inadequacy is. And again, shock the conscious. Again, if there's some kind of fraud involved, they want to stop this whole process and start over. So, in a foreclosure, the purchaser receives only a certificate of sale, not a deed. In some instances, it's called a sheriff's deed. In our, in this area, it's called a sheriff's deed that you get at a foreclosure sale. Again, if the property is not redeemed during the redemption period, then the sheriff, again, issues a deed to the purchaser. So again, it, so this period of redemption in Ohio, you can only redeem up to the point of the actual court authorizes the sale, confirms the sale. So at that point in time, you get the sheriff's deed. Foreclosure by power of sale, the trustee deed. Several states allow a lender or trustee under the deed of trust to exercise what's called a non-judicial foreclosure remedy if the right is stated of the mortgage or deed of trust. In Ohio, we don't have this. In Ohio, we only see judicial foreclosures. So you don't really have to know a lot about this for your law test. No, it's out there, but again, you're not going to see this happening in Ohio. Strict foreclosure. The court orders the borrower to pay the debt owed by a certain date. If the borrower is unable to pay the debt by that date, the borrower loses the right to equitable redemption of the property. Okay, so disbursement of sale proceeds. Okay, so you lost the house in foreclosure, but you had some equity, and they actually were able to sell it for a decent amount. Does that mean you lose everything? Not necessarily. The first thing that happens when a house is sold any property tax liens are going to be paid because they're first priority. Expenses and costs of the foreclosure. This is before the mortgage. Expenses and costs of foreclosure will be paid. The payment of the first priority debt, which is the senior lien, which would be the typical mortgage. Including accrued interest and principal. Then payment to the second priority debt, which is called junior lien holders. That might be the second mortgage. It could be the main, the a mechanics lien. It could be somebody filed a, a lien against the property or you were in court somewhere and you owe money and the only way they were able to pay it is from your estate, real estate. That could also become a junior lien holder. And then if there's any surplus sale proceeds, the balance goes back to the borrower. So guess what? After all this happens, if the borrower has been in the house long enough to get some equity, they could end up getting some cash back if the house sells for enough money. A deficiency judgment. It's a money judgment that may be issued if the sale is insufficient to cover the debt owed. And it's not available for non-judicial foreclosures. But it, that's what I'm talking about. This deficiency, this, this gap between where the short sale happened and what was owed to the mortgage company or where the foreclosure happened and what was owed to the mortgage company, you have deficiency judgment. In a foreclosure, it's not really a matter of issue. But in a short sale, that deficiency is where you're going to get that 1099, where they're going to say they forgave the loan, but you still owe taxes on it because you, in essence, got a windfall. Purchase money mortgages are considered non-recourse. The effects of foreclosure upon other liens. Generally, the foreclosure of a lien in the senior position terminates all junior liens. So if there's only enough money to pay the senior position, that's the only person that's going to get paid. We're going through this with bankruptcies right now, where we have tenants that file bankruptcy. When they file bankruptcy, Toys R Us, if they were a tenant in your building, Elder Beerman, if they were a tenant in your building, and they file bankruptcy, 
um, they can terminate the lease and if they still owe you back rent and common area costs or CAM or real estate taxes from years ago, that all gets wiped out through this whole bankruptcy process. We are standing there as creditors with our hands up, but we're unsecured creditors. We are junior lien holders. We don't get anything. Hopefully the people that at least have gave merchandise and stuff, they, they're going to get the money before we will as the landlords. Tax sales. Property creates a superior, property taxes create a superior lien to a mortgage. You can actually go to the Hamilton County Courthouse and go to tax sales. Guess what the property condition is going to be that you're going to see. These are houses that are usually pretty stripped. They're in bad shape. They've been sitting around for a long <coughs> time. The county doesn't come after tax sale for several years. The taxes are due. So these are houses that have been sitting empty, vacant for a long time by the time the tax sale happens. And you can still get a piece of real estate for almost nothing through a tax sale. But that's a piece of real estate that's going to take a lot of money to recondition. But there are people that will do it. Um, at the time of tax sale, the purchaser receives a tax certificate, which is then subject to statutory right of redemption. So guess what? The people that actually own the property can still come back and try to redeem it, but not typically after it's all done. How does the property get assessed after a tax sale? Assessed. In the sense of what the value would be? Um, the appraiser will just determine a value. Or they'll look at what it actually sold for and use that as the starting value. Okay. Yeah. But through comps, they can give it, an appraiser can give it some kind of value. Okay. Um, there's always a way to give it some kind of value to make it a starting point. Mortgage lenders can obtain insurance against loss through foreclosure through the FHA, through the Department of VA, you do a VA loan, or through PMI, the private mortgage insurance. Guess what? All of us that are doing conventional mortgages, as long as you've mortgaged over 80% of the value, you're, P, you're paying PMI. That's part of the cost, it's part of your mortgage. It's going to be there until you get your equity down from the 80% or lower. So everybody that takes out a mortgage on a house, if they're more than 80% of the value, they're paying PMI, and this is mortgage guarantee insurance. It's going to be guaranteed. You, you default on the mortgage. It's not protecting you as the homeowner. It's protecting the mortgage company. That's what this is all about. That's it. Any